Okay, this next group of instruments that we're gonna talk about is our clamping and occluding and our grasping instruments. So the very first of these that we're gonna talk about is what's called a mosquito. So this is going to be the smallest of what we refer to as hemostats. Now hemostats are utilized either to occlude tissue, vessels, ducts, you know, various different structures prior to resecting them or cutting them. And they also can be utilized to do what we refer to as blunt dissection, which is where we would take the tips of the instrument and kind of open them up in order to separate the natural tissue planes that exist within the human body. So the smallest of the hemostats is what we refer to as a mosquito. Now, the mosquito does come curved and straight. Okay? You will see the serrations on the inside do go all the way from the tip down to the box lock of the instrument. The mosquito only comes in one size. It doesn't come in multiple sizes and it is very small and therefore is utilized with very delicate fine tissue. So you might see it used in hands, feet, on the face, you know, any of these small anatomy areas where the anatomy that we're encountering, the blood vessels, all those different types of structures are going to be very fine and very delicate. The next size up in our hemostats is what we refer to as Kelly's or Kryles. Now the difference between Kelly's and Kryles is the serrations on the inside. So if you take a mosquito and hold it up to a Kelly or Kryle, this is the difference in size that you're gonna be looking at. So it's still pretty fine. It's still gonna be utilized with smaller anatomy, but it is a little bit bigger than your basic mosquito. Now on the Kelly and the Kryle, we said that the serrations are the difference. So on the Kelly, we have serrations that only go part way down, whereas on the cryo, we have serrations that go all the way down to the box lock. Now both of these will come curved and also straight, and again will be utilized either to clamp onto a vessel or a structure that needs to be resected prior to its resection, or to clamp off some area that may be bleeding. Okay, so here's the straight version of each of these also. So you can see the cryo, the serrations go all the way down, the Kelly, the serrations only go part way. Most commonly we use the curved version of these. Again, the surgeons like to see that tip when they're doing their blunt dissection through the tissue. Another way that you might see them utilize a Kelly is when they will do what's called buzzing a hemostat which may be something that your surgeon requests you to do. So they will take and grab on to the tissue that's bleeding and hold it up in the air and then they will take a cautery pencil and apply it to the side of the hemostat. If they ask for a hemostat, they're asking usually for a Kelly or a Kryl. That's the standard size of if they have something bleeding on the field that they want to clamp off, they're gonna want a Kelly or a Kryl. The next size up in our hemostats and the largest of the hemostats is what we refer to as a Mayo or a Rochester peon clamp. Okay, let's put all three of those hemostats together. So we have our Mosquito, our Kelly or our Kryle, and then our Mayo. Now the Mayo does come in various sizes. This is the basic length here in comparison to the Mosquito and the Kelly or the Kryle. It will come in longer lengths, can be utilized obviously for a lot heavier tissue due to its size, and therefore deep inside the wound, we might need a longer length in order to clamp on the tissue that it's being utilized with. Oftentimes we will utilize Mayo clamps to clamp onto the umbilical cord prior to its resection when we deliver the fetus on a C-section. We also will often clamp the peritoneum in order to elevate it up when we are doing initial dissection through the layers on a basic laparotomy so that we don't cut into the abdominal contents. You will see that the serrations on the mayo go all the way down to the box lock. It does come straight, however, we very rarely use the mayo clamp straight, but it does come in the various different lengths as well. A version of the, well, it's similar in size and shape and um, uh, with here on the tips to the mayo is what we refer to as a caramel. Now the difference between the two is if you look at the serrations on the inside. So this is my mayo clamp over here on this side and then the caramel you will see that the serrations are longitudinal and then cross hatched at the tip compared to the serrations on the mayo that are horizontal across. 
the caramel comes in the exact same sizes and lengths as the mayo does and it's utilized for very similar purposes as the mayo clamp is it's just a bigger version of a hemostat we see the caramel to use less frequently than the mayo clamps but they are available in some surgical settings as well now we can use a mayo clamp or a caramel to load our peanut as well so remember the peanut sponges will come housed in a sponge like this when you pull them out you want to just load them right in the tip of that instrument and then they would be utilized for blunt dissection up on the field so a mayo or a caramel is what we are going to be loading a peanut sponge on and then following their use you need to make sure that you put it back inside the sponge so it doesn't get lost another specific hemostat that you might see utilized is what we refer to as an adsen tonsil clamp now you can see the shape of this is a little bit different it's very fine it has a very long shaft here and it's really very short up here compared to you know the tips like on the caramel they're kind of equal in length the tips and then the shaft on this one the tips are still very fine and the shaft is much longer and when you look at the serrations on the inside you can see that they only go part way down. So some people refer to this as just a long Kelly because remember the Kelly serrations only went part way down too. They didn't go all the way down to the box lock. So it's like a Kelly at the tip except the shaft is much, much longer. So we'll use this when we need fine dissection in a narrow area, such as deep in the throat on a tonsil, which is of course why it's referred to as an adsen tonsil. And some other surgeons like it too, just for fine dissection in really tight areas in the abdomen and various different areas as well. So that might be a surgeon preference that they might like to use for their fine dissection as well. Okay, the next type of a hemostat that we have is our right angles. So sometimes out in the facilities, they'll just say, okay, I need a right angle, but there really is a difference between these two. So you see how the this one, which is going to be our mixer, is a lot blunter at the tip than the Leahy is, where it's going to be more fine pointed at the tip. And then when you look at the serrations on the inside, you're going to see that the Leahy serrations are going to be horizontal, or excuse me, the Leahy serrations are going to be vertical so that they look like a, an L. And then the Mixner serrations are going to be horizontal all the way across, all the way from the box lock, all the way down to the tip. So this is going to be your Leahy and this one is going to be your mixer. Now when we use a right angle, we're going to utilize that to dissect around tubular types of structures to isolate them. And then we also can use them loaded with a suture in the tip as what we refer to as a tie on a passer. Sometimes when we need to get deep in the wound when I can't take my hands to place the tie deep down, I can load that tie into the instrument and then use that to pass it around a structure deep inside a wound. So we have our Leahy and our Mixner, which are referred to as our right angle clamps. Okay, then we have our grasping types of instruments. So the first of these is what we refer to as a coker. So if you look at the tip of this, you can see that there are teeth. So we have two teeth on one side and one teeth on, tooth on the other side, and you can see the, the horizontal serrations that are on the inside. So of course we would never take this instrument and place it on any fine delicate tissue like a bowel because it's going to cause damage to it. So the only types of tissue that we use this with are muscle fascia or things that we're not worried about damaging such as maybe a specimen that's going to be removed and sent off. But very commonly utilized to grasp onto tendons and muscle fascia types of tissue that are thick and heavy in order to lift them up or manipulate them throughout the case. So the coker has the teeth at the tip and it's going to be the only one of our instruments that is toothed right there at the end. Okay, the next of our grasping instruments that we have here are our Alice and our Adair. So the Alice and the Adair do have teeth at the end, but they're not the same as the coker. So you can see they're teeny tiny teeth where they're not going to do the same damage to tissue that a coker would. So the Alice is the one that is smaller. It's not nearly as flared at the end as the Adair is. So we tend to say the Adair has flare. So you can see it's wide and broad and flares out at the end where the Alice is much finer and it's going to be smaller. 
The Alice is utilized to clamp onto tube-like structures. A lot of times we'll clamp the edge of the skin on a mastectomy with this, or we grab onto a specimen that's going to be resected with an Alice. And the Adair is pretty much only utilized to clamp onto the vaginal mucosa when we're doing A and P resection. And what they'll do is they'll just clamp all along the side, and the, of course the Adair is gonna take up a lot of surface area where instead of placing a bunch of Alice's, we can only place a few Adair's. So the Alice is smaller and the Adair is much broader and wider and flares out at the edges. The next grasping instrument we have is what is called a Babcock. So the Babcock is an atraumatic grasper. You see there's no teeth on here and it's going to have that hole in the center. So most commonly when we use a Babcock, we're using it with bowel tissue. So if you think about B for Babcock, B for bowel, those are, that's the most common place where this is going to be utilized. Now it could be utilized to grab around some type of a tube-like structure like a vas deferens or something like that too, but most commonly it's ut utilized to grasp onto the bowel during bowel resections, anastomosis, those different types of things. It does come in various lengths, only comes straight when we utilize it during the surgical procedure. Next instrument is going to be the ring forcep or the Forrester ring forcep. So you will see, of course, it has the ring in the end of it. It does come, come curved and straight. However, most commonly we use it straight. It does come in a shorter length too, but that really is not utilized very commonly. The ring forcep is most generally utilized loaded with the Ratex sponge that has been folded in thirds and then gets loaded on the tip and then when it's loaded this way then we refer to this as a sponge stick and then that's going to be utilized for blunt dissection inside the wound. So when you load that on the tip you want to make sure that your instrument isn't too high so that they're going to be dissecting with the instrument instead of the sponge itself and you want to make sure that it's not too low so it's not floppy. Okay, So it needs to be firm at the tip so that they're actually doing blunt dissection with the tip of that sponge. We also use these ring forceps to clamp onto the uterus during a C-section in order to help with the hemostasis of the uterus after the fetus is delivered as well. Next we have towel clips, perforating towel clips. And you can see they come in two sizes, so we call this a baby towel clip. And the name of these really is Bacchus. Uh, however, most people don't refer to them as a Bacchus. They would call them a perforating towel clip. And so you can see the tips are very, very sharp. So they will poke a hole in any paper drape that they're placed on. So we would never take one of these and attach your cautery or suction to your drapes. They can be utilized to secure linen around the incision site, such as the square off towels or possibly a towel that's been placed around an extremity. They can also be utilized as a bone holding forcep in order to pull the two pieces of the bone together prior to placing plates and screws and put those two pieces of the bone back together. Now the other version is what we refer to as a non-perforating towel clip. So you can see the difference between those two. This one has no teeth or pointed edges on it. So this is what we're going to utilize in order to clamp our cautery and our suction to our drapes in order to secure them up at the field. We would never utilize a perforating towel clip because it's gonna place a hole and then we would have a contamination and a breakdown in our barrier from the unsterile areas. Now, our non-clamp-like grasping items are going to be referred to as forceps, and there are various different types of those that are utilized with various different types of tissue. The largest of these is what we refer to as the Ferris Smith. So you can see it's a very large forcep. It has very thick teeth in the tip of it, and so therefore is going to be utilized with thick, heavy tissue, such as muscle fascia, tendons, joint capsules, things like that, very commonly utilized in orthopedics, but can be utilized when closing the muscle fascia on an abdominal case as well. So that's the largest of our forceps, the Ferris Smith. We then have our Adson forceps, and these are gonna be the smallest of the forceps that we commonly use. And you can see, compared to a Ferris, the difference in size and of course because they're much much smaller they're going to be utilized with a lot finer more delicate tissue 
So we said the ferrous was heavy, thick tissue. The adsen then is going to be hand cases, feet cases, things on the face, you know, where we have that fine, delicate types of tissue. So we have an adsen with teeth very, very commonly utilized on almost every procedure to close the skin. So we always use two with a skin stapler. And then usually, even if we're just doing a running stitch or an interrupted stitch, whatever the stitch is on the skin, we're gonna be utilizing an Adsen forcep for closure. We have an Adsen without teeth. So it looks exactly the same on the side, except one has teeth and the other one doesn't. So sometimes on hand cases, we're manipulating nerves and things that would be damaged by the teeth. So we wanna make sure that we use an Adsen without teeth on any type of tissue that might be damaged. Now the Adsen Brown, you can see the difference between the regular Adsen with teeth and the Adsen Brown. Has multiple teeny tiny teeth in the tip and can be utilized pretty much for any of the same purposes that the Adsen with teeth is utilized. It'll just be the surgeon's preference as to which one they like to use. Now the Adsen Lorenz is really just a larger version of the Adsen with teeth. You can see that the end here is much longer but it really looks exactly the same as an Adsen with teeth at the tip. And again, it's gonna be a surgeon preference as to which one they want, like to use, but they're gonna use it for the exact same purposes as they would an Adsen with teeth. Commonly, surgeons who have larger hands like to use the larger Adsen Lorenz instead of the Adsen with teeth when they're closing their skin. Next forcep that we have is referred to as a DeBakey forcep. Now, the DeBakey forcep will come in multiple lengths depending on where it needs to be utilized during the case. If you look at the teeth on the inside, you're gonna see multiple teeny tiny teeth, which are not gonna do damage to any type of tissue that they grab onto. So we refer to this as an atraumatic forcep. So we're gonna use it on any tissue that could potentially be damaged by a forcep that has teeth in it. So we always use it inside the abdomen on the peritoneal la la layer and then anything that's inside the abdomen as well. We also might use it anytime that we're dealing with nerves or any type of tissue that might be damaged. We also would always wanna use it on bowel in order to prevent perforation of that structure as well. So that's our DeBakey forcep, which is a very, very commonly utilized forcep during surgical procedures. Another atraumatic forcep that is very commonly utilized by GYN surgeons is what we refer to as a Russian forcep. So you can see the cup in the tip and again, it's gonna be an atraumatic forcep. You see no teeth there at the tip. So it could be utilized basically on the peritoneal lever, layer and inside, similar to where the DeBakey forcep is utilized, but the OBGYN surgeons tend to utilize it more commonly instead of a DeBakey, but utilized on the same types of tissue. It does come in multiple lengths as well, so it can be utilized deep inside the wound. And sometimes you'll see an orthopedic surgeon use this because it's nice to pick up some bone graft and place it into a wound because it has that cup at the end of it, which is easy to grasp those bone pieces of tissue as well. So that's a Russian forcep. Next forcep we have is what's called a tissue forcep with teeth. So this will come in multiple lengths. This just happens to be the basic length. If you look at the tip, you will see, of course, there are teeth that are uh, at the very tip that will cause damage to any uh, structure that they are placed on. So we would make sure that we never use this on the peritoneal layer or anything inside the abdomen. Most commonly used when we're going in and doing that initial dissection through the skin, the sub -Q, and the muscle fascia on a basic abdominal procedure. Again, we'll come in various different lengths, so we can use it deep if we need to grab onto some structure that's okay to be damaged, and it does have that teeth at the end to grab on. Another version of that is going to be what we refer to as a thumb forcep or a tissue forcep without teeth. So here's our tissue forcep with teeth. You saw the tip or the teeth at the tip there, and then here's our thumb forcep or our tissue forcep without teeth could be utilized in place of a DeBakey because again, it's not gonna have any teeth, could be considered an atraumatic forcep, so could grab onto any different type of layer of tissue that it needs to be utilized throughout the case. It will come in various different lengths as well. This is the basic length, depending on where it needs to be utilized during the case. Our last forcep is what we refer to as a bayonet forcep. 
The bayonet forcep comes in two lengths. This is the shorter length. There is a longer length too. You can see the bayonet has this hump in it, which the purpose of that is to move the surgeon's hand out of the way so that they can look down the tip of the instrument into the wound. So we always utilize it in this position, never in this position. So when it gets handed up to the field, we always hand it so that the hump is up and they're looking down the barrel of like a bayonet if it was attached to a gun in the Civil War times. It's the same idea about the bayonet forcep. We utilize this um, to place cottonoids into the wound. We also use it in the nasal cavity in order to get into a deep, narrow space for grabbing any of those uh, tissues or placing sponges or anything else that night need to be placed into that area. You will see that there's no teeth. It is again an atraumatic forcep because it will be contacting structures such as the dura or the brain or the nerves very commonly utilized during neurosurgical procedures in order to grab onto those various different types of tissue.